Paris, Paris South Eleven, also known as the Crazy French Man, <laughs> which is my co University Blaise Pascal. So, the talk we'll be giving today is about one of our uh, tools for easing parallel programming for people, and we will go through some um, global overview and some kind of uh, technical implementation details to see how blue step does building this stuff. So basically, the context of this work is scientific computing. And as most of us can see, in scientific computing there is two parts. There is a scientific part, which means that most of the applications in scientific computing are domain driven. You are not making random scientific computing, you are making physics, you are making biology, you are making artificial vision, radar application, whatever. And most of the time, the users are not developers in the term that they weren't teach how to develop properly. They forced to use a computer to develop with, and they try to do their best. And in those cases, when they basically know something, they are really trying to change their habits. And there is computing. And computing basically means that if I want to compute something, it better be fast. Okay? Because the fastest, the faster you compute, the earlier you get your research results, your product uh, specification, or whatever. And basically, getting time, 10 times faster in, is not just getting 10 times faster, it's having your results for your publication of your product 10 times faster. And the problem is that to get fast, you basically need to know some kind of, well, fine grained information about your system, your compiler, your architectures, and whatever. And most of the time, this knowledge with your expertise because you don't know how a parallel machine works just by looking at it. And the problem is that for this kind of users, this kind of expertise is not easy to get. So the question is, well, can, can we find a way so people that use computer to do science without being computer scientists get the, the, the speed from the machine and yet focus on the important thing for them, which is the science. And basically, if you look at that, there is three kinds of users. First, Alice. Alice is basically the scientist, which is not a computer scientist. She knows a couple of tools for computing. She knows a couple of tools for statistic analysis or whatever. And basically, what she do all day long, and thinking about problems, and trying to get results out of the data using those tools. And basically, you know practically nothing about compilers, and less than nothing about architecture. So how many Alice in the room? Okay. <laughs> Could be worse. And then there is Bob. Bob is actually a trained developer in the in new few languages, good or bad. But his work is basically making development. He's not a computing uh, a numerical computing expert. And one one of his work includes this kind of computation. I have to solve a system, I have to compute whatever operation on the signals. He wants to do that fast because it's not his, you know, um, fundamental expertise uh, domain. And there is Carol, which is an code expert. She knows everything she has to know about his machines, how to program it properly, how to get control over his code. And basically, Carol doesn't like to use tools because most of the time, as she said, with tools, I'm losing control. So how many Bob in the audience? Okay. And how many Carol? Okay. So, so who's the others? <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's that. And the problem is that if you want to make a tool that makes Alice, Bob and Carol happy, it's a huge job. And it's relatively complex. And the other one. What? And we must add the other one. And, and the other one, yeah. No. And basically you can just build up a library for scientific computing that will satisfy everybody once and for all. So we have to try what all the users want to do with that. these tools. Basically, they want to go fast and handle the architectures without having to learn about that. But if they know something about the architectures, they want to actually give hints to the tools to get more out of the same machine. But basically, they don't want to write any proper architecture-dependent or parallel programming-dependent code. So our idea was the following. We will just show the familiar interface that basically satisfy most of this user's uh, psychographs. And basically what we say is that, okay, 
Here is the basic stuff. And now we have an execution mechanism that for you, Bob, or for you, Carol, you can add information about what you are doing right now, and we will take care of that. And basically, we just bring down to the compiler and we will help him generate the proper parallel code. And why do we do that? Basically, well, it is the only trio, generic programming, template meta programming, and embedded domain specific languages. And basically, how can we cook all this stuff so we can satisfy the power of users? That's the question. So basically, we just present a small part of MT2 uh, API and some uh, mouse watering results. And we get into a technical parts about how Proto helped us getting something which is actually working and scalable in terms of compute time. How do we integrate the SIMD support inside of MT2 so the users doesn't know doesn't have to know whatever about that, and how we are actually currently planning to extend that at some point, and we'll conclude on some future works. So, Jean Thierry, it's up to you. So, you will excuse me for my English, it's far... <laughs> oh, I, don't, I, I don't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> So, the interface of MT2 will provide uh, something that in, uh, in the domain, in the lab where I work, is used to prototype by many people. They, I am in an uh, uh, artificial vision laboratory, and many people prototype using MATLAB. So, they, they like using this kind of syntax to produce your, their code, and uh, with MT2, we will, have, we will have such an interface, and we want to have performances. Uh, we will see an example for which, a uh, simple example for which MATLAB gives uh, 80 cycles of, com of uh, CPU by uh, element, and... Uh, we'll see how fast we can get from Yes, and uh, we'll see how fast we get from that. Uh, we want that, as uh, Joel said, it can be easily extendable, and also we want it to serve to uh, a framework to to insert new optimization terms. You want to uh, is SIMD uh, up to now is up to uh, Altivec, SSC two, four, three, four, five, but AVX will come or is almost already coming. What to do to insert it and add the performance uh, following? <coughs> okay, it's also a, a bench for uh, for using uh, uh, things like Proto in, in real life. No. So the MT2 st uh, structure is, uh, <coughs> in fact, three layers. Three layers uh, for it. Uh, the the middle one gave access to uh, standard containers uh, that can be used uh, with uh, all uh, um, standard function as scalars also, and uh, it's the entry point for the user. Uh, mm. Uh, under it, there is the uh, own three points for uh, Carol and Bob. <laughs> and uh, also, the uh, top level uh, is an entry point for both. Because uh, Bob and Carol want to add new things as toolboxes. And allies want to use toolboxes. <coughs> for example, in uh, their polynomials, for example, uh, can use table as storage, but will add a new semantic. Addition of two polynomials is not the addition of the table. We must uh, shift first so the dimension, <coughs> the degrees will match. So, Table of type and settings is a simple uh, multidimensional array that uh, has the MATLAB uh, behavior and functionalities uh, of the 
uh, standard variable in MATLAB, which is always, if you don't specify, uh, an array of doubles. And uh, as I said, most mathematical functions are, can be directly used on table on an uh, element-wise basis. If, if you use the cos, it can be used, the entire cos, it can be used on a scalar, on a table, or on expressions of table. <coughs> okay, <coughs> the way it works. You take a MATLAB file, M file, you copy it to a CPP file, you include <laughs> NT2 uh, headers, do some cosmetic change. Eventually, you must uh, declare variables in C++ <laughs> and uh, things like that. You cannot use a column to, uh, to say all the elements in a range. So, uh, underscore will be used, something, some things like that. And, uh, we compile the file and link with a small libp2.a. So, we separate, in fact, the, uh, the, API, the API between what must be done by final users on what must be done by uh, C++ uh, power users. So, uh, in MATLAB, well, up to now, there is mostly free functions, and that's the way that the user uses. <coughs> they don't use the, the class in, in MATLAB, generally, to, to compute their scripts and uh, execute them. Uh, C++, Operation has mostly member function. So when we call a size, for example, a size uh, function, if it is size of x, it will act as MATLAB. It is m point size, it will act like C++. Just as you see here. Uh, m point size is the number of element of the matrix, and size of m is, in fact, of a kind of vector containing the dimension of the, of the matrix. Yeah. So, uh, we have the support for C++ and the support for MATLAB. Uh, the containers are containers in the STL sense. Uh, Iterators range are supported, and uh, boost and SQL <coughs> are usable on our continents. Um, in the MATLAB point of view, index that at one. Um, it's optional. It, it's a default, but it's optional. If one really wants to start to 25, he can. <laughs> or minus three. Or minus three. Um, the default also is the major column order for uh, arrays because of Fortran MATLAB compatibility. Uh, when you have a n-dimensional table, you can put it in a bigger one or uh, restrict it to a smaller one. So there must be more dimension or uh, around a cut <coughs> of the matrix. And <coughs> as I said, underline represent the same symbol as column in MATLAB. If uh, there is a... Everybody knows about MATLAB? Uh, okay. Or not? No, no, it's but there is an example. Yes, uh, perhaps Octave or... Uh, or Stephen. Oh. Uh, of course, there is no way to get a perfect container for all things. Uh, we use compile time policies to select the kind of containers. Uh, for example, the, the containers can be used as view on other container or pointers. They can be uh, uh, sized at compile time, static allocation. They can be 
uh, stored in other scheme than uh, major column order. And uh, the indexes can not be one, but be selected for each dimension. This, is, this can be a sugar for filtering, for example, the mask, the filter masks. Uh, Yes, yes. What about things like uh, lower triangular? Uh, yeah. Yes, we have, we have shape as well. Yes, we have shape also. So did you guys look at that uh, at MTL when, uh, when trying to figure out these? We, we basically look at this for basis and we try to fit it in our own you know, container yes. concept. And basically, what we do is the same as LAPAC because we differentiate the shape and the shape uh, storage, yes. which means that you can have a triangular matrix which is still completely the memory instead of being memory optimized. Yeah, yeah there is shape. Yeah, yeah there is shape. Okay. And uh, the last point is uh, named containers that, uh, that can simplify some uh, uh, optimization. Some optimization. And aliasing effects. Does it actually use multi-character literals? Yes. 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 Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a way of identifying aliases? Yeah. yeah. Because basically, for example, when we, when we do something like A equal uh, A plus transpose of A, we wanted to do a couple of times that A is on both sides, and you can do that from the, uh, from the IST. So we just put back the name of the container into the IST types. Okay. That's fully optional. <laughs> <laughs> so, MATLAB. This is a very simple algorithm that, trans that convert uh, RGB image to YUV. So you have your image I, you use MATLAB to extract the three uh, planes and you compute to get UV. Yeah, YUV. And beware with be fast. Yes. So MT2. Uh, we must declare the the variables. <coughs> Uh, I is supposed to come from uh, from mass, <laughs> and, and uh, that's uh, the same thing, almost. In fact, we can say that A and G B are shallow from I, because there is no need to copy them. Uh, we can, if we know that they have a fixed size, and uh, uh, yes, and uh, there is some thing also called evaluation context that can say, oh, it's interesting to unroll the loops inside with a factor five. This is uh, not internal to the matrix, uh, the, oh, the tables, but it can be said uh, external. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. No? Does the one? Does the one? Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what I have uh, list? No, the function object. Uh, function. Yes. The function object. Uh, uh, no, yeah. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, so at some point in time, there has be. Uh, we may want to actually generate some code for this and call it later. Okay. Because, for example, the data are not yet there and stuff like that. So it was before the time we knew about universal placeholder. So be with us. Basically, you can say, okay, the output of context evaluation is basically a void function. Okay. And you can just store the result of the evaluation of this expression template into k and do whatever you want there and call k afterwards. And you can call k whatever times you want. You can basically <coughs> change the contents of RGB between call and stuff like that. And the operation will be done each time with different values. Well, if we weren't going to do this now, basically have placeholders everywhere and have context return some kind of uh, lambda function operating on matrix directly. But basically it was a way to actually pass context enabled expression to some other function that was waiting for function. Yep. Yeah. 
why would that be better, what you said you would do now? I, I don't know enough yeah, about well, proto uh, Lifetime management issues. What if I, I send key wherever else and those stuff are destroyed? Bad key. I see. Okay. Yeah, that's why I'm. Well, most of the time it doesn't happen, but I don't like too much of that. You want to like, no, 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 okay, okay. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, the, so now. The results. Yeah, results. So, we compare to uh, latest MATLAB with multi core enabled, and what we count is how many cycles, CPU cycles, we take to process one pixel of the output, of the, of the output images. <coughs> The battery <coughs> MATLAB is between 85 and 100 cycles per point, with two cores. The C equivalent code is basically four times faster, something like that. And with one core, we are basically at the same level of performances. And so we activate multi cores. Basically, the expected speed up. And instead of activating multi cores, we activated the SAD extension inside the processors. So here, if we work with floats, we have a four way uh, SID uh, internal register files. And so basically, we have a speed up of around four. And we can just put both together and basically have the final result. Yes, it's something I forgot to say. I passed from double to float at some point. In, at some point. Yeah. Uh, because for all this kind of calculation, this is uninteresting to use double. Uh, it is uh, much more uh, involved to say it in uh, MATLAB. And all the way, I tried it, and it gives the same time. Because I think all the computation had a double in internal. So basically, we wait for a four times speed up with SIMD. I think we are there. And we wait for a two times speed up with OpenMP on two cores. And we are basically there also. Which means that we go from yeah, 30 to 35 times faster than the original MATLAB code. And what was needed for the user to trigger that? Okay, basically compile just by using my dash f openmp dash m scc2. It doesn't have to change the code at all. And everything is determined automatically by the library. So, prototype on MATLAB, because it's easy, or you already have the code, you copy pass, you change, you compile, you see the results. If you're not satisfied, you have whatever option you, you may want to have to trigger whatever, yes? So one of the things required to trigger that amount of speed up was, was yeah. refining the options, right? On the compiler side. It's a, it's a compiler no, option. No, 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 I mean, refining, the, you have that little uh, function type expression that goes yeah. in the... Oh, it doesn't need to no, set no. anything in the context. No. Mm. Is, that, is that what you ask? Uh, I'm back coming back. Level. There, you mean? Yeah, settings of... Size, no, 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 you don't have to set anything on the matrices. No, this, this is the speed up from the basic yeah. version. Oh, and you don't have to say you don't have you don't have to say yeah. Uh, I want to use SIMD there. Mm. Well, I know that. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I know that. But oh, like, it's a more. Ah. So, for example, you say it's a shallow copy. Yeah. If you. Are these numbers measured with shallow in there? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yes. basically the, the yes. result from okay. this one. Uh, no, sorry. It's a result from this one. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so it would be probably a little bit yeah. slower if you... Oh, yeah. If, uh, if, if I remove through. the shallow, basically... Um, if you re remove the fixed size, then? No, no, oh, well, the fixed size, no, because no, no, basically it's, small, small it's smaller, yeah. Uh, basically, if I remove the shallow, and I remove the shallow in C2, we go from 23 to 50 something. Basically, okay, two, times, two times slower. But the corresponding speed up is basically the same. So we don't trash whatever other, other optimization. Yeah. 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 So basically, yeah, basically that. So, okay, yes? If you wanted that conversion to be in place, so pixel by pixel, you go from RGB to. Oh, in place, replacement. Could you do that? To oh, yeah. save memory? Or yeah, 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 you can. Yeah. Yeah. I think it will basically be the same stuff like that because it will also preserve copies to be done. So, yeah, you can do in place. If, if the algorithm is not, uh, you know, like looking around for a pixel, well, it could be done, yes. I'm a little confused. What is the OpenMP code? Oh, inside. It's in the, uh, in the library. In the library. It's in there. To take care of that. For, for our lives, it's perfect. Yes. Uh, one question is that SIMD speed up dependent uh, on the size of the problem. So are there caching effects? 
But basically, when you use SIMD, you basically uh, running through the data by pack of two, four, eight, yeah, or sixteen. Yeah, I know, okay. But, but basically, what happens is that it reduces cache miss because you load less from the memories and you load from already adding yet. Uh, memory address which actually fits in the but cache. I, I think it's a simple, simple operation, so what I would expect it to be memory bound. Oh, there you are. There you are. If I take a 32 by 32 <coughs> or 64 by 64, I don't have any speed up. Sorry? If I get smaller images, I don't get four speed up, I get something like two. And the cutoff there is at this size. Below 128 by 128, the SID speed up and the OpenMP speed up is, is far lower. Of course. Well, we don't do any magic on that. But basically, okay. uh, it's something like, yeah, um, it's, it should be 20 to 25 operations per memory load. So it's basically just upward the uh, memory bound limit. Okay. Yes? So I don't know if that's related to what you were asking, but uh, I have a question about, you know, with, with processing images like that, yeah. um, ideally you would want to Partition. If you have a processor which maybe has four cores yeah. in a socket and it has another, you know, you have mm -hmm. multiple sockets, yeah. you would ideally want to partition your image so that yeah. uh, you stay local to your yes. socket. Yes. And I was just wondering what oh. uh, um, kind of support there is for that. I've, I think we don't have it right now, but it's basically something that could be put into the context. And you say yeah. I have two sockets and not just eight cores. Right, for example. Because but they're, they're not. Yeah, we, we, need to, we need to split and, and, they're and not And the other thing I was, was going to ask is actually do you have any support for the actual MATLAB API? You seem to be very strongly you know, tied with MATLAB. No, in that respect. You're giving all no, 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 examples. No, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean by it's your time, motivation? In fact. And um, I'm just wondering whether your table yeah. is. Uh, extensible, so to speak, to actually represent a MATLAB array. Uh, it, they are MATLAB array by design. They actually, actually have the exact same behaviors as whatever MATLAB array you have. Maybe not those two times. Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. Table ask like any array variable in MATLAB. Exact same semantic and the exact same result for function. Okay. okay. Well, and on top of that, we have different containers that behave differently, but the table is basically the MATLAB, the MATLAB stuff. So yeah, okay, converting images, it's all fine and dandy, but what about some real-life applications? So uh, we use that to implement various algorithms uh, in the field of computer visions. Uh, autonomous vehicle con con uh, convoy, where basically we, we use... Yeah, people the, implemented, the people yeah. Implemented. Which I think better. <laughs> so we have a couple of automatic driven uh, cars that follow themselves uh, one into the others. We have a way to another algorithm which, well, this is there, but it's basically the same as this one. So, and there's two versions. Yeah, basically, we you can drive a car around the corner and, and say, it's, it's and say right okay, there. that's Do it again. Yeah, that's the road I want you to take. And you basically memorize the interest point on, in the 3D world and it can just replay the trajectory all by itself. If you have not blown up all the environment, you can. <laughs> and well, stuff I already showed is basically tracking people in 3Ds and stabilizing image from moving cameras. And basically, most of those uh, were about to run in real time, and I mean video time, video uh, frame rate real time, uh, sent to NT2. So, well, basically, stuff that can be done with that. So, okay, we do stuff, but how do we do that? Basically, the idea was to say, well, MATLAB is just like another domain-specific languages for doing scientific computation. Okay. So what about taking it in, as a whole and putting it back into C++ using an embedded domain-specific language, which is basically building operation entities using techniques like expression templates that will be able to be passed somehow at copy time and used to generate another new code, which is basically what we want the user code to run. And basically, what we do is that doing that, <coughs> information on the uh, expression template stuff that can carry information about what kind of computation I am. I am a computation on table or a matrix or a polynomial or whatever. 
and what kind of uh, optimization wise this expression has to support. And basically, we get this down onto the lowest level, and we can, at each level of the code generation, look at what we are doing right now and take the correct decision in terms of implementation. So basically, how do we write embedded domain specific language in C++ easily? We use Proto. So I won't go too much on that. Go see the talk of Eric this afternoon. So basically, uh, Proto is an embedded domain specific language that helps us define embedded domain specific language in C++. Okay? It basically has a generalized, a generalized concept of expression templates with a lot of syntactic sugar and whatever. And it actually simplifies the work of designing such DSL. Basically, you can just try some grammar or try some uh, transform on your IST and see directly if it works. All the nuts and bolts of expression templates are taken care. And for guys like me that come from the compiler side, we are actually rather happy because we have a grammar, we have semantics, we have code transform, we have code generation process. So it's basically like on the compiler, except you don't have to put your end inside. You have a system of transform that can be used to process um, IST differently, and basically, using Fusion and MPL and other meta programming library, we can write whatever kind of code and this kind of transform rather fast. So basically, the problem we had is that when you look at proto documentation, there is a lot of nice examples, but most of these examples have like two or three terminals, a couple of functions, maybe 10. Except in our case, we have something like 15 to 20 terminals type and more than 200 functions. So the question is, how could we do so we can have all these functions using Proto and the complete time doesn't take ages? So, what we try to do is try to find a transform that will do everything for us depending on what we want it to do and basically end up with a couple of grammar. What we also wanted to do is that if someone came and said, oh, I want this new function to work on your table, it doesn't take more than one day or two days, in, including in to empty two. And we wanted the error message that the user may get are rather sensible and catching errors as uh, early as possible. So what we did is, okay, can we write a generic compilation transform? And how can we add new paths to this stuff? <coughs> and how can SFINA and static set help us not doing uh, too much noise when error came? Basically, when you take uh, a random expression, and you look at it, what you usually use is in, in the context of algebra, uh, linear algebra or scientific computing, you have your table expression, and what you want to do is, for each element in my resulting table, I want to evaluate my highest T on the corresponding element of all my diffs. And you do it in some kind of recursive way to compute everything. And next to that, you need also sometimes to know what's the size of the result matrix. And what do you do? You take your IST and you get it down like that, asking for everybody's size and, and see if it checks. If you want to print it, same thing. So basically, what we needed to do is having a way to generically do some kind of descent into the IST and apply some kind of visitors on those that people can act externally uh, specify or overload. And each time, what do we do? We get some nodes on the IST, we apply the visitors, and we descend recursively into all these uh, child nodes. And we do that until everything is consumed. So basically, we ended up with a proto transform that just says that. Each time I get a node, I'm looking at its tag, I'm instantiating the visitor for this tag, and I'm building a function call with this tag, this function object, all the IST child, and I'm calling the function with that. And recursively, I would do the same for all the child and accumulate the results. Basically, it looks like that. Well, there is a compiled trans grammar, and it's basically all we added to, need, to write. So, it's templated on the visitor type, which is basically a uh, um, lambda function class, if I don't say too much uh, stupid stuff. And basically, what we say is say, okay. Either I have some random nodes, and I want just to traverse it using the visitor, or I'm finding a node which has already been processed using visitors, 
And so I just forward the value to that. And I'm just keeping going in this way. And so basically, if we look at the um, uh, assignment operators of table, we have something like that. We can compile with the size visitors, which basically curl down the IST and try to find how much element should this resulting stuff have. And we recite the correct matrix. And what do we do when we want to evaluate the process? It's rather simplified. There's a lot of more stuff going on. Basically, we say, okay, at the current element, compile the same expressions with a functor visitor, which basically turns the tag into a real function object that will be called on whatever argument I get to. What's traversal? Traversal, I come to that. So basically, traversal is a class that you can overload to specify what happens when I traverse a node with a given visitors. So either you specify different visitors, or you can directly extend traversal to uh, use a non-recursive um, uh, passing through or whatever. And what does traversal does? It calls something which is called process node, which is basically the thing that takes visitor and build whatever function object it needs to evaluate the node. And this process node can be too specialized. So basically, traversal is a proto-transform that say, okay, give me the, type, the tag of the current expression, call process node with, this vis with the visitor and the tag, passing everything from the, uh, from the call to him, and we just forward the call to the process node stuff. So basically, traversal is what shields the users that may want to say, okay, I want to process this kind of node differently than the others, to having to write this kind of proto-transforms. So this is basically the glue that make compile works and make people be able to specialize that with different behaviors. So you never have to write a, a, a proto-transform to do that. And basically, process node, by default, just recursively process all the nodes there and pass it. But you can completely, based on the visitor on the tag, call whatever else you want there. For example, if you have something like I don't know what. But if tag, you are in the if else stuff, and you don't want to evaluate both branches, you would want, just want to write a real if there. You can specify, okay, when I evaluate if with process node, I do whatever. And you don't have to write a different proto transform. And recursive process is just some glue that basically use functional unpack and default tra uh, transform to just say, okay, let's build a function call. Uh, small ist and evaluate it with the default transform. Which basically evaluate all the, all the children and pass it back to the function. And so, what happens with that? We found out that using this kind of compil of compil time, compilation, generate transform, basically helped us going down in compil time. But there was another part which uh, we actually overlooked at first. Is Basically, in Proto, you have two ways to define new function. Either you define a new function object as a terminal, okay, or you build a, a regular function that would use the Proto make X function that would generate the IST node. And the question was, which is the faster? Should we do terminals or should we do make X? And basically, how does it scale with the number of functions we need? So basically, there, we compile and call between 1 and 20, 256 different function objects using terminals, and there <coughs> we use makex functions. And basically, there is a compile time in terminal. And basically, with terminal stuff. Oh, yeah. Can you say which compiler you Oh, uh, GCC 4.4. Uh, and we have basically the same result with MSVC 8. Thanks. Yes, 8. And so basically, we have this kind of, yeah, I don't, I think it's, I don't know if it's linear or quadratic, I think it's linear. <coughs> this kind of increase in compute time there. Where there, using MacRex, we just stay flat, yes? It would really be worth your while to remeasure with 4.5. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you know why. Yeah. Okay, good. And what also happens is that with function terminal object, what happens is that the binary size basically explodes because it has to get all to small stuff for all the function objects, for whatever reason. Well, there you don't have anything because you just have template function. And basically, the, the binary side from this kind 
from this version to this version is basically 1 to 4, or something like that. Mm. Basically, the choice was to not use function object, even if they look easier to define. You just have to put your functor into the post function object and get our dirty with uh, make x. But basically, we have something which is basically constant and far low. So this quite this saved us from the compute time explosion and the compute time generic transform basically helped us to be able to define new way to, to execute stuff on the IST without having to redefine the grammar each time. And basically, if you are poor users and you want to add a new IST stuff, you don't have to write any code. You just write a new visitors or you just write a new process node stuff. And just get passed to the your system. <coughs> So now, what about SIE? First, <coughs> the question is, what kind of parallelism do we want to endorse? Basically, if you look what's available right now, parallelism scale from interprocessor specific instruction set to large system <coughs> cluster of grids passing with multi cores and multi processors. Basically, what we wanted to get is basically being compatible with Boost MPI, but not having any internal MPI support, supporting OpenMP in the regular cases, and support mainstream SIMD extension. So the question is, what's SIMD? Basically, yeah. thanks Wikipedia, an SIMD machine is a machine which basically processes instruction pool and applies them to a set of different data at each side post. So instead of processing one element by one element in your table, we will process them by pack, basically. So most SID enabled processes as a special register file, which is which contain SID dedicated registers. So those registers have a fixed size in byte in bits. Which means that, for example, if you have 128 bytes SID registers. You will be able to store a couple of double, four float, eight short, or sixteen sharp. And we see afterwards that it has its importance. The register size is fixed, and the number of elements inside varies. And all elements from a single register is from the same type. The size in number of elements on the register on the SAD register is called the cardinal of the register. Instruction set to use this specific SND registers are basically irregular and architecture dependent, which means that not all functions exist for all the type, and the function itself is different between architectures. When you try to load the SND register, you have to load that from alien memory block, so we need to take care of memory alignment, and we don't have the full scale of uh, operation on that. So, if you look at what's available uh, right now, we have the Yo uh, SCC2345 uh, family on the x86 architectures, going back from MMX in the 90s. They all provide 128 regi uh, bits registers, and basically they are designed to speed up multimedia uh, computation and have been later fitted back into a more general purpose mode, which will explain a strange choice of basic intrinsics. On the other side of the fence, on power PCs, we have the uh, VMX or RTVEC extensions that also have 128 bits registers, but doesn't support double, contrary to SEC. On the cell, we have the same kind of architectures, except we only support float and short. And contrary to SEC, the, uh, the API is more general purpose with a few dedicated instructions, which means that S uh, simple function are either, uh, most of the time simpler to write using per PC, LTVX, and SEC. And there is other stuff like Cortex and Wallery DSP, which has different flavor of uh, SIMD, and which can be taken the same way. So the question is, what do we want to get from that? Basically, most of the time, we wait for a speedup, which is basically equal to the vectors cardinal. If I process 8 short at a time, I want my speedup to be basically around 8. As I have these new register files, I can I would be able to use different registers for the fast operation and for the others. And some 
extension provide fused operation like multiply have dot product that are basically executed in one cycle. And so we want to take advantage of that to get faster. So in practice, doing that by end, what do we got? In simple precisions, most of the time we have a speed up of four or something, and sometimes we get super linear speed up because on most SID architectures right now, the pipeline of the uh, floating point SID extension is deeper than the scalar one. Basically, the super linear speed up is basically the four times speed up from the cardinals and some of the speed up from the pipeline issues. In double precision, basically, we have a speed up about 1.5, 1.7, and few to non super linear effect because basically, we, we work with a smaller. Um, intrinsic parallelisms, and we can get that much faster. <coughs> and integers, basically, we have speed up between 50 and 80 percent of the maximum one, which means that using a vector of cars, we can go from uh, 8 to 12 or 4 times speed up. But for integers, which has the biggest register files, it's also the type with the less uh, features in terms of functions. And a lot of them need to be mapped by looking at the SIMD registers as a scalar array and just apply the scalar version of the function on each element. Mm -hmm. For example, divisions. <laughs> Integral divisions is just applying the division on all the scalar elements of the vectors, which means we don't get any speed up in integers. So, okay, we have all these problems. Uh, we have to take care of elements, missing features, <coughs> different behaviors, different actor sets. But we want to be able to write SIMD level calls that look the same everywhere. And basically, either architecture's difference provides a decent speed up. And when something is not there, we provide a nice fallback in terms of functions. And all the details about alignment, starting a thingy, will be taken care of. So basically, we look at the SIMD registers as basically a sequence in the term of a fusion sequence. just a complete time sized sequence. And from there, we derive another concept that will be able to handle that. And we will provide some tools to integrate this kind of stuff into other uh, regular uh, code, like an alien, uh, alignment aware allocator and iterator for passing data in an SMD way. And each time you get the next element from the, from the iterator, you get the next SIMD block out of the iterator. And we want that basically to be able to write code quite fast. So we have a registers uh, classes that have two parameters, the type and the number of elements we want. And basically it's a pack of n values of type t. And magically, if the couple t n match <laughs> on your architect on your architectures on the given SIMD registers, we will use that. If not, we just fall back to a boost array of the same size and same type. But for the user it's completely transparent. <coughs> <coughs> Using Proto and IST with, within the SIMD um, operation, we can detect at complete time stuff like, oh, I'm meeting I times B plus C. So I have to, re to replace this source stuff by the correct fuse operation if it's available, save for dark product and other stuff like that. And basically, <coughs> register TN is compatible with all the fusion um, algorithms that doesn't change, uh, but, which is Basically, all fusion sequence algorithms which take const sequence to work with. Yes? Uh, I'm just kind of curious. What, um, <coughs> if you've uh, generated uh, the assembly and if you've looked at uh, the resulting output and yeah. figured out, like, are there other constructs like fusion algorithms or yeah. proto algorithms that uh, certain compilers have a hard time optimizing away? Uh, if there are, I'd be really interested in hearing about that. Sorry? Are there are there uh, fusion <coughs> algorithms, <coughs> algorithms that the compiler has a hard time optimizing? Like ideally, this oh, should yeah. all be inline, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't check. Uh, we tried. Oh yeah, I tried stuff like uh, fold or transform with mm -hmm. fusions, and basically the ICB output was what I was expecting to, and the speed up was basically what I had to to get. Cool. So uh, yeah. There is some that doesn't work well, like, um, what is it? Um, I don't remember. There is a couple algorithm which produces bad code, but I think it's more on our side than our side of fusion, because we, 
we fail to uh, to see some pattern inside. And so uh, basically, the rest doesn't work. In. Yes. Uh, what happens is if I compile on one machine and run the code on another machine, which hasn't any of this SIMD architecture? Oh, uh, let me think. Currently, I think you will, you will just get a tons of illegal instruction errors. Okay. <laughs> so I have yeah. to switch it off manually. Yes, you have to switch it off. What, what we wanted to get at some point is some kind of SIMD check, runtime stuff, oh. yeah. that can <coughs> check that for you and tell you, oh, stop, you are going to write this on not correct. But we didn't want to add that inside the evaluation because uh, we needed the compile time information to generate a really uh, efficient code. And okay. having to check at runtime if this one or this one is jumping, it was too, it was too, um, too mm -hmm. easy to generate correct code. So we, we made the assumption that if you change the machine so much that it doesn't have the same uh, SNE instructions yet, you're bound to be compiled. Okay. Um, just to answer that question. The Intel compiler already does that automatically. You can just set a flag, and it will generate several versions of the code. Or but okay, but this would make his code slower again. Make it, it bigger, not slower. It make it no, bigger. bigger. Ah, okay. And then when the executable gets run, it clicks the yeah. right. Yeah, code. you can okay. you can compile your function in the different transition unit with whatever uh, settings you want, link with everything, and have the runtime check. If I can check. Whatever, I jump in this function and not in right. this function. Wow. But what we wanted to avoid is having this check for jumping to different functions at each point in the, uh, okay. the evaluation. Basically. So we have an SMD allocator, which basically be <coughs> used with whatever STD container and just allocate uh, memory with the proper alignment. So you can basically use any container of whatever as uh, SMD data uh, block. We have allocators, adapters. If you want to use allocators with specific behaviors like pooling or whatever, and we turn it into some kind of allocators that do the same but on the nonlinear uh, boundaries, so you can still keep use boost pool or whatever, for example. And we have a CD iterator stuff, which iterates over container of T and returns register of T n each time you walk up. And we have stuff like is my t is my type T vectorizable? What is color equivalent and stuff like that? So we can write generic code in this case of stuff. Yes? I have one more question about how do you decide what your SMD register size is going to be? Is that just going to be at compile time and detect what yes. platform you're on and then you pick yes. that? Yes. We, we have a static platform and <coughs> stuff that do that for us. But basically all, all the proper compiler except for late, for earlier version of uh, Visual Studio are defined proper uh, Premises is a symbol when you pass the correct option to say I want to compile that with SEC2, you get the SEC2 <coughs> process of stuff and you can check for that. I was just wondering, you said that if the register size doesn't fit completely, now, I'm not sure whether this is supposed to be public interface or more of an implementation detail, but the, what I'm thinking is if you specify the register which is say too big, does it actually fall back on several smaller registers? Uh, we're, it... we're working on that. If you have if you have a uh, SMD register float eight, for example, uh, we are trying to have something to say. Okay, it's just a pair of uh, I mean, it's just a fusion vector of float four, okay. float four, and we accordingly generate the float of that. We are working <coughs> with that. But if you pass float of seven, well, you get a boost array because it's rather hard to you know slice things in proper way. So basically, what's the kind of stuff you can write? So I have a vector of float, and I'm using the SMD allocator to allocate whatever a number of Element. I have some constant register float for there. I'm taking the beginning of V as an SMD <coughs> block and the end of V, and you have just classical iterator based operation going on. Except those iterators are input iterators, and you need to use store to actually put the result back. Mostly because we tried hard being able to write the reference B equal whatever, and it involves proxy object and stuff like that that actually clutters the code generation. So we went back to something like that. And basically, this kind of code uh, basically runs at 80 to 90% of the expected speed up. And there you can see I'm calling stuff like cosinus, and we also provide a large selection of SMD optimized version of most of math, lib math stuff function, which is basically what we will get into right now. 
Absolutely. So, no. sorry. Oh yeah. Sorry to keep but No, no, no. Uh, yeah. So, do you take when it comes to storing to memory? Do you take advantage of the uh, uh, write through SIMD instructions? Like, like MM stream and stuff like that. Yes. Right. Okay. There, <laughs> when you use store and stuff like that yeah. with the a character, because when we trigger vectorization into your library, basically we just check if I have an ex if I have an AST of whatever exp expressions. I'm looking at the type of all my terminals and the written type of all my nodes, and I can decide if this entire operation is compatible with the SAE. And currently, if you have one part of the of the, uh, ex of the expression that doesn't fit, we just fall back to scala evaluation. What we want to be able to do is actually split the IST in different parts and evaluate the most SAE stuff we can. And basically, for the NTU users, all the memory alignment stuff is completely transparent. And we are currently working on something that you can say, okay, I have a table of complex. And instead of storing complex as really imaginary, really imaginary in the memory, sometimes it's better to have all <coughs> one, one of the users and then all the imaginary one of the users. That's like that do. That's like that do. And basically, what we say is that if you register a structure like that with using fusion adaptators, if you pass a fusion sequence to a table, we saw that, and instead of generating one, container of data, we generate one for each fusion elements, and we iterate on them uh, regularly. So basically, if you register complex T to be a fusion uh, sequence, we will store one table for the real and one table for the imaginary, and we will do SID on both. And so we avoid having to switch elements to the vector, which is rather costly, and basically we get best better performance like that. Yes? Isn't it true that in one application you may you may want both representations. That's why yes. it's partial support. <laughs> <laughs> We're currently trying to get around that okay. and try to find a way to basically switch from one to the other properly. And the other problem is that we know how to get from there to there. But for example when you say okay I have my table of complex which is stored as a pair of arrays and one and now I want a reference to the Nth complex in my array, how, how can I generically rebuild the reference to each element in the both array and written in it properly? Simple references is the best you can do. Yeah, but except we wanted to get something that give you out a complex of reference or whatever, but it doesn't work that well. So we may be down to use tuple and call it a day. But, well, basically, most of the time, it's the way we want to go is this one. And what we, what we say is that we guarantee performance when you use NT2 into the, um, what we call the vector mode, which means you only do global operation on the arrays. And once you want to access a particular value for doing whatever, it doesn't guarantee that it will go f as fast or not. That's exactly that. Oh, yeah. And from the developer point of view, register is completely independent of the your stuff. And so basically, well, we can extract it right now, and you see where I'm going. We can have some kind of boost SID stuff, which basically end of that. You can basically design whatever SID based computation you want without having to use the other part of MT2. So you can basically craft your SID algorithm from whatever. And basically, we have a simple extension system we will see further. Well, basically, oh, there is a new architecture is going now. Right now, it has this and this as. Uh, vector register and uh, this and this operation, and basically it's a matter of weeks to basically port so your thing to the whole system and just to compile your whole code of it. So that's the easy part. The not easy part is how can I actually get performance from the SID stuff? And we, can, we just saw a simple example of what kind of stuff we have to think about to get performance out of that. Oh, come on. This is <laughs> For you. This is right. No. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. We, we, if we give uh, any D2 to somebody, Are you doing the say, uh, if we want to use SIMD, ah, we want to have the, the normal functionalities of uh, uh, trigonometric function, uh, exponential, logarithms, etc. Um, with a good performance, uh, CMAT support in, uh, in, in short. Uh, the problems that arise are, what do we want for accuracy? 
what do we want for performances? And on what types do we want these to act? There is a, a real, if you see, for example, the, cos the cosine in the uh, STD, uh, if you try to uh, use the cosine for large values, the completely uh, uh, false result. If you compare with the CRM lib, which uh, assures that uh, for every real you will have uh, the um, half ULP precision, uh, it's, uh, it does not a good result. But for small values, it's quite good. Now, you're talking about a specific library implementation now, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. CRM Live uh, is a library that say for uh, every uh, representable floating point double, I, I compute the uh, half, half ULP uh, result. I didn't mean that. I meant the, you're talking about a specific standard library, C++ standard yes, library. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, and, uh, but for sphere and lab, for these values, we have uh, 2,000 cycles to compute it. So, there is choice to be made. So, in the CMP, tip conversions uh, are clunky because you cannot choose to change the vector size. If you uh, easily if you have a vector of four floats, you can convert it to a vector of four in 32, but not to a vector of uh, eight shorts, because you have to, uh, uh, to, to fill the other values with, uh, with what? And too much branching is very bad, because when uh, we branch in I will uh, restart with that. Uh, for the accuracy problems, we can, one can see there is a problem, <coughs> and one can see there is can say that there is no problem. In fact, it's better. Uh, when we have a, a 128 bits vector, we have four floats, 32 bytes for each float. All the bytes are used, and when you use a scalar FPU, FPU in uh, Intel, you have in fact 80 uh, bits to store uh, in, the, in the extended representation. So when you do computation in scalar, you will get perhaps more precision. But it's not ascertained. Because if you take at a time a register and put it in memory and get back, we have lost the, the intermediate precision. So, Perhaps it's better to know what we are doing in using our fixed size and not going through uh, optimization differences that uh, when I change a line in my code, I pass through memory once <coughs> in the other direction I don't, so the result will be different. It's, uh, uh, SCMD intrinsic generally do not mix vectors, just what I said. You cannot uh, add uh, a vector of shorts with a vector of float because they are, doesn't have the same cardinal. <coughs> uh, there is two ways to cast vector. Uh, a cast that doesn't change bits. And a cast we convert. So we can convert float to int 32 double to int 65. The, for 32 bytes uh, architectures, the, the gestion of int 45 is kind of catastrophic. <laughs> uh, uh, the C style uh, cast is very, very useful in, SC, in SIMD because it tutorizes uh, masking. For the branching, when you say if, then else, in Scala, you choose one of the two branches, and the penalty if you uh, lose is the prediction, the prediction miss. 
When you work in SIMD, you must evaluate both branches and then select for each of the vector elements which is the good one. So, when we have double, for example in C2, the branches say, I, I will do the two parts and the two parts will make no, uh, no speed up because if there are each of them the half of the time, two multiplied by one half equal one. What can be done for branching is, say, uh, very often the vectors contain elements of the same size order, and uh, that will lead to the same branches. So we can do uh, the horizontal branching. What I mean by horizontal branching is there is in uh, SCMD some horizontal um, uh, and six that say, I take a vector, I return a scanner. For example, all will return true if all the elements of the vector are different of zero. And with the kind, this kind of uh, thing, we can do branch in this, uh, in this way. We say, if the parameter is greater than some v0, I do the first algorithm. As I select between the two algorithms. So if algo2 is ev, and this thing happens very often, it's better to do only that. And what we lose is just uh, a single test. So it depends on the evenness of the branches. But, yes? So what is V and V0? In oh, for example, you so when like yeah, I, I, will, I, I, will, uh, I will give um, V and V0 are two vectors. Same two registers. Two, two, two float, two float uh, for example, uh, you want to compute the cosine. If the, the, all the elements of the vector are less than p over 4, it's a lot easier to compute. Else, we have to reduce the range, do things like that. So, that's the kind of thing that can be done. If all the elements are in... This is a small example. You, you can do everything here that compare the element-wise uh, the, uh, on the element wise basis, the element of the vector. And you say, all fulfill this condition. If all fulfill this condition, I have uh, a very fast uh, <coughs> Else, I must do the two and select. Or perhaps, I don't need this one, and, and the algo two will do the stuff for everybody. Yes? I, I think Eric might have been reading that the diff condition as though it were supposed to be actual C++ code, but I, but I think that's just an example. Yeah. It's just a shorthand for yes. evaluating. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yes. It's pseudocode. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're missing some outer parens, as yeah. you can tell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. You see, the, the same thing is the two branches are the way you can see. So, what have we done? Uh, in the first time, we have nothing. So we called standard function and mapped them for the first time. Then we used the free library to look at how the mathematical functions were, were written. In and Scala. In Scala. In Scala. In Scala. And tried to turn the existing algorithm to SIMD ones. And most, uh, not all the time, but most of the time, we can take the SIMD's algorithm and turn back to get better scalar algorithms because there is much less uh, test branching and also it profited to, to the scalar uh, computation. So 
So, what we, do we use? I already spoke of Sarah Liban, which was the, uh, oh, when it was available for the function we, we have written, it was the, uh, the, uh, the reference. Reference because it provided the good result. Uh, Lipse, CFS, FDLibem, BoostMat were used for inspiration on what algorithm to use to write functions in the CMD. And uh, I must say that all these uh, libraries are usable in MT2 through toolbox in Scala and can be mapped also. So, for for example, I treat trigonometric function. All trigonometric function, as they are periodic, use this sketch of okay. algorithm. You reduce the range. Yeah. You use a polynomial approximation this is a on the reduction range, and back. we finalize uh, if needed. <coughs> the you should be good. It is difficult to, to find uh, better things that, uh, uh, that need the help. polynomials that are given in the literature because it's Remez approximation, Minimax approximation, we are very good. So we, in fact, must use it. What I say here is if you have this uh, chain, you can use by specialization of the one on the third. Yes? Uh, why don't you finish your sentence? Uh, you can uh, use specialization of the first and the third step to get three, three functions at the price almost of one. <coughs> so I, I just want to make sure one thing I'm not clear about is this. Are you sketching of what you implemented or are you sketching how you would expect someone else to no, implement it? No, I'm sketching what <coughs> I implemented. Okay. okay. I, I, in fact, more than that. The, this kind of implementation is common to all, almost all mathematical functions. If it is possible to reduce, we reduce. Then we compute, then we finalize. So, so uh, my first question is, what if I know that my values are already normal? Um, so you've taken a lot of care to make the library very extensible and very flexible. Um, what if this algorithm is too complex? I know all of my values are already in the correct range. Uh, we'll we come to that after. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So um, I, perhaps I must be uh, faster on that. But uh, the fact is, the, the reduction step is uh, difficult and can be much more difficult than the computation step. But uh, I, I will skip it. But just what I say. If the <coughs> element in is small or cosine, there is, just compute the polynomial. If it is in a, oh, I, uh, I put here 20 p, but it's uh, greater, the price of the reduction is almost the same as the evaluation. And if it's greater, it's a trade-off between accuracy and uh, time. Uh, for example, uh, the, the cosine in, in the estedelib may, uh, is uh, 115 cycles. Okay? But the cosine in CRM lib can go to 2,000 cycles. But the estedelib is completely false. So, what? Okay. So, this is an example of uh, evaluation of the polynomial. We use that to have static constants. Okay? And order evaluation, perhaps you <laughs> see difficult to read, but just an, uh, an example. Uh, these are the constants that are given by the standard algorithm. Uh, converted to be sure that uh, everything is okay, and uh, it's nece it's uh, quite necessary to do things. Like so, that. Yeah. so are those floating point constants written as hex? Yeah. 
Uh, no. Yes. Uh, um, Sir, but man. We have, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. But, no, basically we, we had problems with platform when you drove drove the XDR whatever yeah. and the whatever was not what we expected to be when we do the computation. Yes. But so we have we have a generous scheme that says, okay, every pattern of bytes I want in my floating point yeah. that's there. So that's not portable though. Or or is is the floating point uh, binary layout is is totally standard and you have to worry about any. Well ends? basically we put it into uh, some kind of uh, well, we just write the byte to an integer and we look at it as a flow. It is standard, yes? Yes. It's, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's basically it's standard. Yeah. It's for all intents and purposes. It's standard. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's why. Yeah. So, there is a, a, some a very little uh, simplification of the cosine algorithm. This part is only, is if x is too large, I take the thing that the user wants to, to take, because I cannot have gain on that. And ca he can choose Sarah uh, Lib, he can choose st uh, STD. And here, the algorithm to compute the cosine. In fact, for, if, uh, for the regular one, we have to, compile, to compute the two, the sine and the cosine, and choose which quadrant we we will so well, the interesting uh, so part of this stuff is basically we ended up with some kind of generic uh, skeleton for algor um, algebraic <coughs> uh, trigonometric and algebraic computation that we can just change parts to get new function or to get specialization and basically uh, we have to find it and basically and basically the scalar version of that is basically the same code except instead of having if any do something we just make a shortcut by returning directly the correct value. Yes. And also, in fact, this is to say if we pass none, we return none, for example. And in the Scala case, it will be a test before, not a test, not a selection after. Okay. So, some results. Um, speed. Uh, for the accuracy, uh, uh, we'll see after, but. Uh, uh, you see, uh, if the range is, uh, we have two versions, a fast version and a normal version. The fast version say, if I am less than <coughs> p over 4, I return the right value, as I return n. Okay? So, you see, uh, std, uh, CRM lib, Fast MT2 in Scala, fast MT2 in SCMD, and the same thing for uh, the regular version uh, in Scala and SCMD. So our cosine on the normal range uh, is 10 cycles by fold. And uh, it's a uh, 10 uh, factor uh, against uh, ST. Why are these other libraries so slow? Why are the other, why why is your competition so slow? Like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I take the. Oh, the we took the stuff out of the box. So uh, I don't okay. Know. Perhaps there is more more testing in the even in the scalar version. On the perhaps the testing were good for all computers, but now uh, code runs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and this is a precision. Uh, the the, <coughs> the figure are in ULP, unit in the last place. So uh, you see, ten power seven, it's not the same thing for STD. If we I, I don't know, I don't understand how to read that. What's the, what's ULP? ULP is unit in the last place. <laughs> so in the uh, last place. In the last place. You say you, you, you in fact if. You have two reals that have the same mantissa, it's the abs value of the difference. If they are not the same, the same exponent. If they are not the same exponent, you multiply by the uh, two powers of minus max of the exponent, and you make the difference. It's, ba it's basically the normalized number of bytes of difference between you from that the pro presentation. Okay, that makes, that makes it, yeah. your table looks like STD is more accurate than NP2. No, for the first no, 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 no
because STD is compared with STD. <laughs> okay. No, don't so, look at the STD column. Just yes. as a reference. No. Yeah, okay. reference. Yes. Okay. okay. The array is badly written. In other words, STD really means the actual value. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The correct value. Okay. And this for other function implemented, some uh, choice, you see. I, I, don't, uh, I don't want to... Uh, to ba basically, we, we have two to uh, ten times speed up on most, on regular range. This is a elliptical integral, there's a flow, okay, uh, the axis. How do you have a deal on like values? I don't have that. We don't. Yeah. Okay. We don't because uh, well, it doesn't make any sense to run with that anyway. Yes, yes, it makes sense. It yeah, makes well, sense, but it will. Uh, yes, it will. It will kill your performance. But yes. I'm just curious. Yes, but uh, for many functions, uh, well, perhaps uh, it's not a real trade-off. But uh, of course, uh, if one uh, wants, uh, he can go to Scala. Perhaps I don't. I, we are not treated uh, the case. Uh, most of the time, most of the time, there is no problem about that. But uh, many functions have no problems of uh, evaluation. So for example, uh, the sign for uh, small values are x. So they return exactly the values if they are very small. Cosine, if the, the, the cosine of a denormalized uh, is uh, one. Um, that's true. Yes, then I'm agree with you. There is a problem. Okay. okay, we complete that with how we want to extend the stuff. So we try to be fast. Uh, basically, at some point, uh, we may need to have user defined types into our tables because I want to take whatever uh, table of quaternions or whatever other domain specific application types we may want to do that. And what we wanted to be able to do is that if those user defined type have some already defined function for an exam, we just want to include them into entity without any works and just say to the user, say, okay, if you run this specific function you don't handle, we have the way to uh, help you support it. So basically, there is two parts. The first part is how we can tell entity that the type is something he has a right to put into a, a table and how we can forward uh, operation. <coughs> And basically what we do is the following. For handling the difference, the different kind of calls that we can have in a function, like I want to call a function between a double and a float, a double and a matrix of uh, integer or whatever, we need a way to have uh, a process that can tell us, okay, I have all these different types and I want to know which specialization of this function I need to call. Okay. Basically if I hold scalars, I will call the scalar version, if I have some scalars and some container, I will jump to the container versions. And if I have some container and some expression, I want to jump to the expression building function and stuff like that. And we wanted to have that from a single entry point template function. So what we do is the following. We say, okay, for each type, we define what we call the granularity. This is the scalar, this is the container, this is an expression, whatever. And the rank, which is a relative position of the type in its own granularity. And basically, non registered type has a granularity and a rank, which is well, it's not infinite, but it's like long max or whatever. And for whatever set of types, we compute what we call the dominant type, which is the type with the biggest granularity and rank. And it takes a, uh, it takes a category of this type, which is so afterwards what I mean, and I jump into the proper factors. So the question is, how do I register the type? It's basically that. And take whatever stuff that already exists there. Okay, I have a new category with this. Uh, amount of rank, and the category of quaternion is that basically a scorer, a scalar version of quaternion. Basically, it says when I found a boost quaternion somewhere, I will treat it like a scalar values of rank 5000 or whatever. It is. And this will help us jump into the correct way. Or the other way around, if you are currently writing your own classes, you can just register the category and set some tag inside the classes, and it works. That is that. Now, I have my type registered. How do I endorse the variability of the function? We have more than 250 math functions in NT2, and we can call that on whatever. The question is that 
how can I support which type I need? I, I have the right to call that. Can I have nice error messages? And how can I specialize those functions? So if we start enumerating all the combination of overload, it's rather go bad at some point. We can use partial template overloads, but sometimes there is some ambiguities which is not easy to uh, uh, handle. And if I add a new types, I have to add all the new overload to all the others. So it wasn't it wasn't good enough. So what we did is say, okay, we tie the semantic of function to a tag, which is simple type. We say, okay, m is a square root function, and basically we say, okay, the square root function of whatever just calls the functor of square root with whatever values, and we just use the result of protocol to get the result of that, and we see how it will evolve. What's inside functor? Basically, functor has two stuff. It has a call protocol that say, okay, every some value computes stuff with that. And there is a validation protocol that say, okay, every types, tell me if I have the right to call this function with these types. So the, process, the call processing is done in an external class, which is called call. <laughs> yeah. That users can specify either by function tag or category tag. So we can say for all category of types, my function SQLT is the same code, or SQLT for Scala is done this way, and SQLT for SIMD is done this way. And basically, basically has some kind of result of support. It's basically a different color object. So for example, if I have a Scala or whatever, and I have my square root, I just call, for example, SQLT square root, and I say that my result type is a tip A turned into a real type, uh, which is compatible with that. On the same way, okay. It was what happened inside uh, functors. I want to call some functors of random range of uh, arguments. I just call the dominant meta function, which gives me the category to pass to call, and I get the result of call as a result of the functors. And I just forward the call to the call specialization. And the validate class helps to filter out incorrect calls using Sfine. And basically I say, for example, I only want to validate, I want, only want to call square root of scalar when the actual scalar is a floating point value. If it's not, I don't want that. And basically we add that into this kind of uh, stuff. So what do we do? I have a square root functors, I take whatever, and if, yeah, A0 is there of course. <laughs> <laughs> and basically, if A0 is validated by the functor, I'm returning the result type of the functor, and inside I'm just building the functor and calling it. And basically, what happens is sometimes you don't even have to write the validate code for you because the result, the result of protocol will take care. For example, when I, addish, when I have two SID values, the two values should be of the same type. So I just wait for this kind of result of call, and if I pass two vectors of different types, this won't match, and the spinner will say, no, I can't find any call that works. Yes? Wouldn't you get a, uh, a compile time error in that case uh, for result being uh, incomplete? No. Nope. I think you need uh, you know, a result to be an empty struct. Currently it works. Serious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, at first I thought the same, and one day I forgot the empty stuff, and it works the same. So I'm not sure if that's standard, but okay. Yeah. But actually, it, it works on both our compilers. So right. what? But doesn't I mean doesn't cost too much to to add the whatever. Yeah. Yes. Can you go back to the previous slide, please. Oh. Um, no, that's not oh, the old one. Oh, no, <laughs> previous slide. Okay, this one. Uh, good I, I, I can't see what T is being defined in the SQLT function. Yeah. Well, yep. But the, what I was going to ask is, do you, use, do you always pass things by const reference? Or Currently, you, yes. Have you looked at using boost call traits? Oh, uh, uh, yep. Do you, need, do you need, well, this is the part that's That's not clear to me, is are you? Cool. So, what? <laughs> That's a problem with contracts. Because the, the names don't tell you what it's ah, okay. what it's doing. It's, it's yeah, we could use contracts. 
But we should. Well, it depends on whether you're trying to deduce t or not, and that's the part that I can't figure out. Yeah, yeah, well, well, you you have to write t as a zero there, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will correct that. So uh, so this uh, so this so basically when you don't say anything and you rock when you call call or write it on an unknown type, you basically say you force the FCNA to fail and you output some static set saying oh you are calling something that you shouldn't be able to do. And basically if I do that, I have an integers <coughs> and I said earlier that I don't want to call SQRT on integers, and I do something stupid like calling SQRT on a string, which is a non registered type. What the users get is just two lines of errors. No call the function is created int. Okay? And for the columns SQL string of something like I've just made that up but you know how it looks. Static set, unsupported function call with functor square root on STD string. So, okay. Most of the time people are happy with that. <laughs> so basically now we want to make a new function. What do we do? We just have to define the, the uh, functor tags and cause the macros there that just output the enable if stuff and we include whatever uh, files needed to be and this for example is an abstract uh, absolute value with kind of right. types uh, we have a set of uh, small uh, result of computers that say okay give me a list of type and I will give you the correct arithmetic types or the correct floating point types so when I have a value, absolute value I want to return the arithmetic proportion of the uh, input and we have some kind of internet dispatch that say, depending on the category of this type, okay, if this type match what we call the real set, which is basically say, is it float or double? Is it an unsigned type or a senior type? We jump into different uh, local variations on that. And basically what we have, this type there, basically MPL set of related types, and we just use a hash key to know where to jump into the uh, proper evaluation. Basically, as we have colorful objects, we just need a simple adaptators to make them uh, Phoenix function. And basically, we have a whole lambda uh, folders with all the MT2 function being able to be used directly with uh, Phoenix space order. And so you can use whatever a special MT2 function into whatever lambda function directly, just by including the proper file. So to conclude, because it was wrong. So, uh, the problem was, can we have some kind of proper matrix or array competition library? The answer is, we can't have the perfect one. So what we want to do is, I mean, something which is actually correct, and if you're not happy with that or that, just write whatever you want, and we can give you tools to put it into the system. We made some strange choice, so the API looks more like MATLAB or whatever than real C++. But most of the time, that's what our users wanted. Because, uh, as I told some people, many of our users are specialized in what we call C++, which is basically C without the function. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see all from where we are coming, okay? Uh, again, <laughs> just repeating myself from my last year talk, we were completely uh, spiffed about the simplicity of using loose component to get this running. Uh, the old NT2 version was a monster of 5,000 files <coughs> with handwritten template, per, uh, expression template stuff, yes. half of the MPL done by hand, and I can tell you it was bad. And basically, two years ago, we switched to old boost, and basically, we are up back there. And wow, the real NT2 parts, if you don't look at all the specific function files, the core of the library is like less than 200 files. Basically, divided the code base by 25. Yeah, and again, boost proton. Right, what else? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we are cooking stuff right now. Uh, we have um, postdoc uh, working in GPU support using the context facilities. Basically, say, okay, I want to evaluate this operation on whatever GPU. Uh, we are trying to get some sparse matrix support, and by sparse, I mean real, you know, unstructured sparse matrix. Like, structure? Yeah, like I have values everywhere without, it's not diagonal or, yeah, or okay. we have value everywhere and I don't know where. We have this color Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's not that easy. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we have PhD starting next September uh, to work on the um, seamless integration of the MPI support. And basically, if you run the same NT2 code on the clusters, you just compile with API and everything runs. Do it. Well, that's the idea. And uh, afterward, like I don't know when, <laughs> Soon, I hope. 
well, some more sooner than the others. Uh, we have a research project that we actually asked for some funding for the support for embedded system. We already have good results with the cell, but we want to get onto some stuff that are actually used by people. <laughs> uh, we have some platforms that doesn't even have a C++ compiler, so we are basically screwed. So the idea is to have some kind of context that say, okay, just generate C code or whatever code at runtime, compile it and give me the pointer to the function through some kind of dynamic library and call that. And what we want to do is basically, when you look at what we do as optimization, like I want to roll, I want to vectorize and stuff like that, we do this by hand for each case, and we have to check it doesn't break the other ones. There is basically a global framework which is called the polyhedral model that say when you work on multiple dimension loop nest and do some operation on an array, this loop nest can be seen as a multidimensional polyhedron, which is basically a build by the limits of your loop nest. Okay, and inside there is a vector field, which is basically um, the orientation of the, um, what's the name for that, of the dependencies of one value and one others. And what do we, what do you do to optimize a program represented like that? You just compute the properties that bring your polyhedron like straight mm -hmm. and put all your vector fields like that. Okay, and so basically to do that, we need a way to do some kind of stuff like complete time matrix inversions and compute time linear system resolution. But we think we can do that. I, I know Steven has some stuff like that, I think, already. So, so yeah. you have something I have both of those, but they're limited to awesome. what the types that uh, units library uses. Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, when I saw what you did with that, I was like, okay, this could work. It's basically, it's all integral-based yes. uh, math stuff, mostly of size of four or seven, so it would fit, we hope. Well, I will get some students to make it work anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the idea with that, that we don't have to, to think about how to write the optimization. We just do the polyhedral transformation and it's done. And you just generate the code back from the new polyhedral. Well, this is just... Well, people do that by hand, so it should be... <coughs> and what we wanted to do is having some kind of generic approach of parallelism in which uh, we can have there we have some kind of models of what the matrix or table is and how to generate code from that for given architectures. But the architectures information are basically hardwired. Uh, the idea we have is can we have some kind of generic component representing an architecture? And you just have to write this if a new architecture come out and everything works all together. So that's basically for take 10 or 12 next year, but yeah. And well, what about giving back? So as I say, all the SCMD support stuff is completely standable right now, so it can be completely extracted. Uh, same thing for the generalist front of dispatch. Uh, we have fast current math function next to that, so it's maybe not boost SMD, but boost whatever fast math. And, uh, well, it's not giving back, should I put that elsewhere, but uh, if the boost math authors are somewhere to be found, uh, we need some clues how to actually vectorize your implementation of stuff like uh, integrals and stuff like that. So for each of those things, uh, what, yeah. what position is it in the current review queue? Uh, well, currently I may need to just have some boost SMD stuff done somewhere and put it on the list currently, and we can see for the review queue afterwards. But if you remember the thread with that... The short story is I, I want this. Okay, boost, so... Please. <laughs> So okay, so if you want that. Here, <coughs> okay, and some, as I say, the generator from the dispatch and the generic <coughs> compilation stuff, uh, I basically extracted it and tried to write some kind of Phoenix version of that using the generic comp compiled generation. It worked. The, the student we have was a Google of some of code as it, and he's playing with that. So maybe we can see if we can actually crossbreed every prototype with that. Uh, because I think the, this kind of idea is to separate the part when you specify what happened in the node, so you don't have to write proto transform, it's maybe something good to have. So users can actually specify what their Phoenix uh, function does without having to dig into the internals of proto. So, yeah, maybe. And uh, I found quite interesting to have this kind of recursive tree traversal, and I wonder if it could be turned into some kind of real optimized primitive transform in proto itself, to have some kind of recurring, re recursive process of the IST doing whatever visitor we want on that. 
Not sure if it's actually useful. Thanks for your lengthy attention to the subject. Okay, great. <laughs> when are you going to submit these things for for review here? Oh, okay. Uh, which which one? All of them. Okay. So here's my steps. Uh, and, and I think I don't have the stamina to support uh, that into Boost and having all the stuff going on afterwards. Uh, for whatever reason. But... And quoi? Oh, I'll talk about that later. Uh, what, what we want to do is having, is basically more being some kind of sibling project to say, oh, we are completely full Boost compatible and we use part of Boost. And migrate parts of what we can be expected from our own code base to generic stuff. So, uh, well. To give me a week or so, I can have potential table with the essay and this stuff going on. So maybe people can check that. There is still a bit of work to get things working properly, so but can be refined. Uh, the other problem is that uh, yeah, we have thirty and we have three hundred functions. So should we put everything in or whatever and stuff like that, or in some modular systems? But I'm completely open to uh, bring that up to, uh, to review or whatever. Yes? So, since you're saying that right now NT2 yeah. is not being sort of considered for boost, uh, is this available? Okay, so, and there is an old, ugly version on the net already, uh -huh. which works. <coughs> but don't look, uh, don't look inside because you are with bin. <laughs> no, I, I really mean, it works. Somehow, with basically the same performances, but the design is far, is far, far worse. The example where don't read it. Yeah. And the new one. So it's something which is available. Currently, what we are working right now at the moment, and when I, I mean I say right now, I mean like now, okay, after lunch, is trying to get everything from the old version, the new version, and some prototype we have all glued on into a reasonable form. And we need some help, like uh, if anybody knew about how to, more, how to make CMake work on this kind of stuff, and some guide, Git experts, we are completely open to help because we don't have any proper build system right now, and that's a bit limiting us to make a release, but if people want to help on this side, we are completely open, and as soon as we have a proper build system, the whole thing will be available anyway as uh, open source software. And uh, basically the idea is to have basic stuff working, and keeping on improving with different toolboxes on support for whatever architectures, instead of just waiting to have everything working on. But it will be available, yes. You can send me an email, I have a list of people which need to be updated when this thing is out, so I can add your name in the right. And yeah.